It was the Dalai Lama himself who said, when we speak, we hear words we already know, but when we listen, we have the ability to learn something new. Cool. All right. Thanks, Steve. Nice one. Thanks a lot. Um, actually, it's the second time I've been here to do a talk. The last time I was here, there was no chairs or anything here. Is that right? It's changed, I think, last time. It was really funny because it was just people sat on the floor and we were all kind of like a, a weird level. Anyway, right. Thanks for uh, inviting me to talk today, uh, which is really cool. Um, it's nice to be invited. And um, so, yeah, as Steve said, my name is Daniel Jones. Uh, my brand is actually called The Aspie World, which is what you can see here. Um, and what I do uh, is um, I'm a... I'm a I suppose I'm an advocate, I suppose, but I make content on the internet for autism and um, it's education for autism and uh, OCD and ADHD and dyslexia because I have a diagnosis of Asperger's syndrome, ADHD, OCD and dyslexia and uh, I make weekly videos uh, every single week and actually do three videos a week on my social media platforms. That's every single social media platform going, which is, <clears throat> excuse me, very, very uh, testing, but it's really good. I, I love making the content. So. I have all my notes for this talk prepared on my phone because I'm very professional, and uh, this is how I do it. So um, I am a YouTuber full-time. It's what I do for work. This is my uh, form of employment. I make YouTube videos primarily, but obviously all of these uh, are content uh, distribution platforms as well, and I'll get into a bit of that as well. So. <clears throat> My YouTube channel's won uh, two, not three awards. I just won uh, another award, and I'm nominated for an Autism Professional Award this year by the National Autistic Society, uh, which we'll be going to in February. That's kind of cool. I got 117,000 subscribers to the YouTube channel, which is quite interesting. Uh, I'm also a best-selling author in three languages, uh, and I got a best-seller in the United States, the United Kingdom, uh, and I also have a, uh, a degree in chemistry. Uh, I'm, I'm a musician as well with uh, records out on, on record labels, so I've done quite a bit of things, um, and I'll talk to you all about those things. It's quite interesting since we're in employability, uh, you know, future talks and stuff like that about autism and employability, we'll, we'll kind of dive into that a little bit more, and how I was able to... Uh, create uh, job opportunities for myself and things like that. But um, basically what I do is I create all these social media uh, presentations and these, these talks and these videos and this content to try and increase the, 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 the viewpoint of how people see autistic people to help it change the narrative a little bit. Because there's a big uh, kind of consensus of people seeing something one way uh, and in a quite negative way and, and not actually seeing it for what it is, uh, an autism spectrum disorder for what, what it actually is. And, and I'll get into what I mean by that because that sounds quite confusing, but I will, I will explain it. So the idea is having a, a positive message. And what I'd like, like to try and start my talks off with is when people always ask me, because I do a lot of like motivational kind of posts about autism on my social medias, and people say, oh, are you a glass half empty, glass half full kind of guy? How, you know, are you optimist, pessimist? And I say, look, all I see is a glass and I'm very thankful I have it. And that's how we'll, we'll keep the theme of the conversation. And that's a very good way to look at things. So um, I do this talk kind of talking about being awesomely autistic and what that kind of means. And it's almost like talking about why it's empowering. And, and it's, it's funny, when you, when you think about people on the autism spectrum, everyone has this kind of uh, idea that when you think about autism, it's quite a negative thing, because you think, oh, you know, it's a diagnosis. And when you have a diagnosis of something, you've obviously gone through a clinical process. And the clinical process is never really a good thing. Nobody ever goes to a hospital for something really good, you know? You go to a park to have fun, or, or you go to a rock concert to have fun. You never really go to a hospital to have fun. It's bizarre, isn't it? So the idea, obviously, from the onset, it's also a negative uh, idea. So we're trying to kind of cut through that narrative and not think about the negative, think about more of the positive things. So I, uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I, like I was saying earlier, I got a degree in chemistry. And one example I will talk about uh, where we're looking at like positives rather than negatives is um, I'm really bad at like sports, really bad at sports. My coordination is pretty bad. Um, and I have like <laughs> sensory, processing, sensory processing disorder as well. So like walking through doors is quite difficult for me sometimes. So sports is never a good thing. But I do have a degree in chemistry, and the reason I was able to do that degree is because I have a uh, hyper-focus on something which I find quite interesting, and I loved ionic transfer charges and balancing equations, which sounds really boring, but it's really awesome. And so I was able to focus in on something that I really enjoyed, and that hyper-focus meant that I could actually take that further. So what I did in this instance is I focused on something that I can do and didn't worry about the things that I can't do. See, so many parents who are sometimes the biggest critics without even realizing it. They sit back and they say to their, their, their kids, like they look at their kids and they think, oh, the, 
They'll never be able to do the normal stuff, or they'll never be able to be, you know, a big friend circle, or go to Ibiza with their friends, not like anybody wants to, but, you know, those things that they feel like are the norms, right? And you think, well, yeah, but I'm not a cold and blue chef. I don't wake up every day worrying about the fact that I'm not a good chef. I wake up every day and I go, okay, what am I good at? And I focus on that. So there's an example of how we need to change this kind of idea, this, this narrative of, of, uh, of how we see autism spectrum disorders and how people relate to those and, and treat them. So another example of how uh, an autism spectrum disorder can be like supercharged to do something awesome is uh, a friend of mine, um, Shal Davis, is actually an MTV tattoo artist. Uh, she's got her own show on MTV called Just the Two of Us. Uh, I think it's in like season five or six or something, which is awesome. And uh, she is on the spectrum, but she is an amazing tattoo artist. Obviously, she has her own MTV show. You have to be pretty decent to be on TV. And uh, the reason she's able to do this is because she has a fine attention to detail because of the way her brain is wired, which is an amazing thing. Now, people on the spectrum obviously get taught, told all the time, like, you know, you're not going to be able to do this, so why don't you, like, when I was in high school, instead of doing GCSEs, I had to, like, circle pictures of, like, tennis rackets and stuff and, like, sports apparatus that link to each other, and it was really bizarre, and it wasn't anything like, I, I was getting nothing from it, that wasn't a maths lesson, it was terrible. So we're always taught this like idea that we're never going to do those things like normal people, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But again, my friend Shah was able to get a career, a very successful tattoo artist career, because she has an exceptional attention to detail, which is a great thing, right? So there are strengths and weaknesses in everything, but we don't really want to focus on weaknesses because that doesn't get anybody anywhere. Um, and another example of this is think about problem solving. People on the spectrum like to problem solve. I love problem solving. It's amazing. It's probably why I love maths and chemistry so much. But in terms of problem solving, a friend of mine. Uh, her brother is autistic, and she, uh, he had a bit of a meltdown and broke the door handle in his bedroom. And uh, so the door handle was broken for quite some time, and then he decided to, he loves Lego, so he decided to make a new door handle out of Lego and install the new door handle on the door, and it works way better than the one that was on it before. So now he has this Lego door handle. Again, this is a way of thinking, well, if you focus on a negative, oh my goodness, you know, he had a meltdown and he like, broke this door handle, and that's all you focus on, that's all you'll ever see. But if you think, look at the bigger picture, the problem-solving aspect of it was that he was able to create something from very basic materials to create a better function than the thing that was there before by a carpenter. So I think like it, it, those, in those aspects, in those principles, autism is a very interesting um, concept uh, for when we look at things that people can do. And, and I always try and think about that. People always say, oh, you're quite a beat. And again, it's because I never worry about the things that I can't do. Unless, obviously, I have to talk about the things that I can't do. Because sometimes it does happen when you, you know, reach out for help and stuff, yes. But in terms of how I propel myself forward, definitely career-wise, and other kind of opportunities and aspects in my life, I always look at the things that I can do. So one, another example, I'm just going to talk about problem solving and problems versus solutions, is uh, I'm a best-selling author, right? And I said this at the beginning of my opening speech, I've got a, a book out in three languages, it's a bestseller in the United States, bestseller in the United Kingdom, pretty crazy, right? It was a fully published book on a publisher. I, I didn't self-publish, it was actually published. Now, I'm also very dyslexic. I'm like super dyslexic, even so that a lot of the letters that I get from governments are on a disc, an audio disc, so I can listen to them. So being dyslexic that much, how does a dyslexic guy get a best-selling book? You know, how does a dyslexic guy be a best-selling author? So it's all about problem versus solution. So I decided that there was a very simple solution to uh, the, the problem. I needed to figure out how, I was very good at talking, as you can probably imagine. Um, and uh, I was able to just spew out all the stories and the things that I wanted to talk about, but I wasn't very good at articulating them into written English in the format of beautiful words. But I knew somebody who was. So then we teamed up and she became my ghostwriter. And then I dictated to her, she wrote it down. We got a book publishing deal and the book went out. Easy peasy. Because what we didn't do is we didn't focus on the fact that I'm dyslexic, I'm never gonna write a book. We looked at the fact that, hey, what can we do? And that's the kind of attitude I want to try and rock people in the way that. Um, same as with the, the chemistry degree, you know, like I left school and no GCSEs. How do I, how on earth did I become a scientist and have a, you know, a degree in chemistry? It's the most bizarre thing in the world. And I've always been interested in science. And it wasn't until um, later on, obviously, I, I actually went back to, to do my degree. Uh, and later on in life, I wasn't actually, it didn't go straight from school, but I mean, I did like a mature student course. And again, it was a problem versus solution. I, I actually had, the teachers I had when I was in high school, terrible, terrible teachers. Back in the 90s, rubbish. Nobody understood learning needs. Everyone was just like, you know, do the same thing, and it was rubbish. 
So then I uh, went to do an access course, and then uh, I actually had some support from the government through, um, they have like a dis disability learning uh, like outcomes thing where they can help with funding for people to mentor you and stuff. And that mentorship helped me actually understand organization in university and college, and then actually helped me through my degree. So that was a pretty amazing time. Giving the opportunity to do something like that was able to propel me forward into getting this uh, degree. And then, the other example of like my hyper focus and the determination to look at something uh, as as a as a challenge in a, in a good way rather than a negative way was uh, I was uh, always interested in music. I'm in a band. I've played music for years, and um, I wanted to have a record out in Japan. I know it's weird, isn't it? But I just always loved to have a record out in Japan. I'm fascinated by the culture, and so I didn't know any Japanese or anybody in Japan. And then I managed to get an album out in Japan. It got to number five in the HMV charts in Japan and Tower Records, which is pretty crazy. Got a record deal on a CD out there. It was pretty, pretty immense. But again, it was a problem versus solution. I just decided that I would make friends with people who were in the music industry in Japan and online, obviously via talking on Facebook. And then we did that. And then we you know, shopped around some CDs and then eventually a label picked it up and then we went, we went for it. So again, it wasn't, I wasn't focusing on the fact that like, oh, I don't speak Japanese and I'm never gonna go to Japan. It was more like, hey, how do I get a record out there? And let's, let's figure that out, which is pretty cool. So when people think of the term autism, and this is all building up, I'm gonna talk about like uh, careers and stuff like that. But when, when people think of the term autism, they always think negatively. They always think of things like, um, you know, they think of, uh, the, the, the kid who's vulnerable, or they'll think of like Rain Man, oh, that's a horrible example, isn't it? And I don't know, not even bloody autism, but they'll think of like the, the, the words, they'll think of negative, because that's all they know. Because like I said before, you know, when, when, you're, when you're asking for help in a, in a clinical environment, when you're going to school because of issues, this becomes a negative kind of like stigma around the whole idea of it. But when, when you think of like autism, you never think of like Susan Boyle, or Dan Aykroyd, or Greta Thunberg, or Owl City, you never think of these people People who are doing amazing things on a world stage because that's not the first thing you think about because those are positive things which is really bizarre and it, this is a, a strange phenomenon which we're currently faced with which is why I believe that like 82% of uh, autistic people in the UK are unemployed because we're obviously faced with a negative for instance a friend of mine who's autistic a female she went for five job interviews she got each one of the jobs but the reason why I know this story is because when she then started and said that she was on the spectrum and she needed some additional help there, they then said that they were closing the position. It's happened five times, which is insane, right? And now she's self-employed. But that was quite an interesting, uh, because everyone's thinking this negatively. They're not thinking it forward. Um, there are other opportunities which I've been involved with uh, that were all ready to go and do, and then those opportunities closed because they then realized that it may be a risk to be publicly having a, an autistic person and representing your brand in that way, and then they don't want that kind of negative feedback, which is quite an interesting uh, experience. So, it again, it's because a lot of the time, media focus on negatives, right? You know, how many times, um, <laughs> they never say, if Susan Boyle had, had, had an album out and it went to like number one, they never say, autistic person Susan Boyle had an album got to number one, they never say that, they just say, Susan Boyle's album got number one. But if a guy goes to a school in America, shoots it up, and he happens to have Asperger's syndrome diagnosis, they'll turn around and be like, autistic kid shoots up a school. How weird is that? So they, the, the media are to blame partly for the fact that there's this negative stigma on it, but of course they're part of this whole hysteria where there's some negative ideas around autism. But I think that there's some great work being done, especially in the National, National Autistic Society, bringing this wave of more of an acceptance and normalizing the idea of it rather than negatively impacting it. And, um, and it becomes more positive through normalization, which is a really, really cool thing. So. Yeah, um, let me look at one of my notes here. I'm like going off script here talking about crazy stuff. But um, it, it's more of the fact that, again, when, when the parent, and I said before, parents are like some of the biggest critics of their kids. And they say like, oh, you know, he's not going to be able to do this. And then that gives like a, a weird feeling and the kid can feel that. And then so if you're growing up and your parents are always telling you you can't do something, I mean, what state does that leave you in? It's weird, isn't it? And I get loads of parents asking me all the time. They say, oh, um, you know, my kid just wants to play Minecraft all the time. What am I going to do? And I say, well, let him play Minecraft. Like, what's, what's the big issue? And they say, yeah, but he's on it all day. And I'm like, yeah, it's great. Minecraft is great. Gaming is fantastic. It, it opens up ideas of problem solving, uh, real life solutions, of trying to communicate with other people. All these forms, uh, there's a lesson to be learned in everything. And more importantly, a friend of mine called Sean, who runs a, a, a channel called Jack Septicai, he actually is like a millionaire from playing games on the internet. So, yeah, let your kid play Minecraft. I mean, th there's no. Um, there's nothing wrong with that. But I think that parents are, are so locked into this idea that they're never gonna be able to have a future and, and, and a career 
you know, being, being autistic, when I say the exact opposite. So, what, this is what I mean by, when I say people are being awesomely autistic, I think what's awesome about it is that people can be, you know, the best Fortnite or PUBG player in the world, or the best Minecraft player in the world. Like if a parent comes to me and says, oh my kid's obsessed with Lego, all I want to do is play with Lego, and blah 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 blah, he's never going to get a girlfriend or a boyfriend or whatever, and I say, okay, well that's fine, because that's how they want to live their life, and then, hey, why don't you just throw as much Lego and Lego training at them as possible, because maybe they could get a job in Legoland. You know, there's, there's countless opportunities for things like that, but people don't ever see it like that, because we're always forced into these specific boxes and specific shapes, which I find uh, absolutely uh, amazing. So, um, if you look at like, Greta Thunberg, right, she was a, an autistic female who wanted to do something about the environment and all, like, she's a really big environmental activist, right, like, world famous, hitting up world leaders, going to, like, the UN, doing all kinds of crazy stuff, which is amazing, because her parents allowed her to use her hyper-focus on the thing that she was really interested in to become the person she is today, which is actually changing the world, and without people on the spectrum, like Nikola Tesla, and things like that, you wouldn't have the certain technologies, which I find quite fascinating, and so an example of how I did this, how do I, so I was, uh, I was in full-time employment, but then I had a huge meltdown, and, and I'd been switching between jobs all the time, like jumping. After a couple of months, I'd get super depressed, I'd be on medication, and then I was jumping around, and it wasn't making much sense, and then I had an autism diagnosis, and then I was in full-time employment at the time, and I'd been there the longest I'd ever been in an employment, and um, I had a huge meltdown in the office, because they decided that they were going to... Without, sorry, I get kind of, because still quite upset. They decided they were going to move the desks around, um, and they were going to change change all the layout. I'd been in the same layout for a year and a half, maybe two years. I was quite upset, so I went to work, and, and they changed all my desk around. It was just, it was all, it was overwhelming, and I just, I couldn't deal with it, and then I had a horrible meltdown in, in work, and it was highly embarrassing also. So then uh, they took me out of that, and then it turns out my doctor was like, okay, well, you can't do that. You can only work two days a week with any more than that. It's going to cause you excessive mental health uh, issues, and you're just, it's not going to be any good for you. I said, well, nobody can live for two days a week. I mean, what, what on earth is going to happen? And so I was faced with a conundrum then, and like, what do I do with work? So I did my degree in chemistry, thinking that maybe I could do some science work um, or freelancing or something or other. But at the time, I was actually uh, working on a YouTube channel, creating content, uh, talking about my journey and my ups and downs and my, uh, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And then that decided to, uh, it just kind of took off. Like more people wanted to know about it. And then there was this lovely thing that YouTube brought out where you can monetize your videos, which means you can get a little bit of ad revenue from your videos. So when the time was right, and I was not in work, not in university, or on or any kind of benefit or anything. I said, okay, well, why don't I try and do this as a job? So I did that. And one of the ways I did it was I <laughs> got obsessed with something called SEO, which is search engine optimization, right? It's an amazing thing. It works on algorithmic changes in Google. It's amazing. I love it. And it's how Google uh, takes your data and, and, pr and promotes it internally to other people. So if you're on YouTube and you're looking at cat videos, how many other cat videos appear alongside it? And I wanted to be in those suggested videos. So I didn't know anything about it. And I watched this channel called Video Influencers, and I watched it every single night until about 3 o'clock in the morning, my girlfriend sitting in bed, like, you still up watching that stuff on the iPad? I'm like, yeah, 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 and I was watching it, and it basically had hundreds and hundreds of experts, YouTube experts, people who were like superheroes in my mind, like, who were just experts in how they built their YouTube channels to be in a business and a brand, and I was like, wow, I wanted to learn how to do that, and I was like, this is, this is my calling, you know? So anyway, I, I learned, 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 and I, I studied and studied for about three, four months solid, literally every single day, I, I'd only have like maybe four hours sleep a night, Anyway, that was in January 2018. In July, sorry, in June 2018, I was invited up to VidCon in LA um, to, uh, to attend a video conference by YouTube. YouTube invited me out my channel started growing and gained considerable exponential growth through my uh, hyper-focus on obsessed with trying to make it grow. And so while I was there, the, the irony was that this channel, Video Influencers, interviewed me on their channel to tell people how they could grow their channel. So I come from January 2018, looking at these people thinking, oh my goodness, these guys are gods. And then me being on that channel. It was the most bizarre experience I'd ever, ever, ever experienced in my life. And then, um, you know, fast forward again, like 2019, I was in LA again, I invited out, I was doing a speech there on neurodiversity, autism and ADHD. First one in the world, actually, uh, in a conference like this. And this was the largest video conference in the world. It took until, and this is like, it was year 11. And it took us 11 years to get into to do a panel on autism. And uh, I was interviewed by CNN about autism and, and employability, and it was quite interesting. And they were saying about how they feel like, you know, oh, you know, autistic people aren't into work. What, what, what's the issue? Why, why aren't autistic people in work? And it's very simple. <clears throat> 
people are focusing on the wrong things. Like I said before, people want to know how full or empty their glass is and are really thankful that they have a glass. People are always focusing on the negative, what they can't do, why they can't do this, why they can't sit in that office. If I had just dwelled on the fact that I couldn't sit in an office for longer than two days before damaging my mental health, I'd be nowhere. But instead, I decided to take my ideas of my hyper-focus, how the things that I am good at, yes, I'm not brilliant at everything, but the things that I am good at, why don't I turn it into a job? Anybody has the ability, everybody has the same chance as anyone else, we just have to find that way of relating and connecting that to something that's going to be monetarily favourable, and that is the premise of my talk. So, thank you so much for listening, and uh, I just want to take any questions, if anyone has any questions at all. So I couldn't actually go into the office then. So we, we, I worked from home for a little bit to integrate it. And then I started going into the office for a couple of days. And every time we went, you know, two, two to three days really, every time we got to that point, it was just like panic attack mode, meltdown mode, I couldn't focus, they were sending me home. So it was kind of like, oh shoot, you know, what do we, how do we fix this? And of course my nurses were like, well, this environment isn't fitting for you, you know? But like, you know, what can you do? And I said, well, I've got two days. And I said, okay, two, two days. And they were literally quite adamant. They were like, any more? That's, could be damaging because at the end of the day, I was like, "Well, I need money." They said, "Yeah, we need to stay alive." So, you know, it was very di difficult to balance that out. I found it quite hard, actually. Yeah. I hope that answers that question. Yeah. Cool. Yes. Yes. That's a good question. Um, I would have to say that, I mean, if I was to, if I was to go now to a uh, you know, typical employment, uh, I would probably try to have a representative with me from like a mental health team or somebody like that. I know that sounds kind of like a bit overkill, but obviously, you know, employees have a duty of care. So if they do employ somebody, then they are by law really, uh, you know, bound to conduct things in a fair manner and have a duty of care to make sure the person is, is taken care of. I suppose what my friend could have done is, you know, she could have taken legal action against the people who've just done that because it's discrimination at the end of the day. Um, I mean, unfortunately, it's a, it's, a, it's a difficult one to answer because you want, you, you want to disclose something because you want to have the best outcomes, but at the same time, you don't want to disclose it to have the best outcome. So it's a bit of a catch-22. Um, and I think you just have to, I say, judge it on the employer, you, you know. If it's like a nasty corporation, we don't care about it, and yeah, but if it's like an employee who'd be really interested in, like, you know, Microsoft or Google hire people on the spectrum quite often because they know that those traits and talents are there, so it might actually work in favour in certain companies, especially IT companies. So it depends on the employer, I'm guessing. Should sure. Hey, um, right, I'm a uh, person, I recently got an MBA in translation, but I find it very difficult to, you know, get work in that field. So are, are you suggesting, uh, I'm also a bit of a poet and a writer, so do you think I should go to places like Patreon and whatever to, you know, um, put my stuff out there and, um, you know, get myself, you know, out in the open? Okay, straight away, if you're making content, yeah, so if it's written content, whatever it is, spoken word, whatever, you need to be making uh, YouTube videos, Instagram videos, Facebook posts, LinkedIn posts, TikTok videos, sounds like overkill, but if you don't do it, you'll fall. Because if you, so put it this way, if, if you're not, like for me, making my own show on YouTube, if, if BBC or Channel 4 didn't pick me up to make a TV show, then I would have to do this, which I'm doing, to make myself sink or swim, right? So if a publisher is going to publish your work, but you haven't been published yet, and you need to self-publish it, because it's millions and millions of eyeballs, this is attention. So what these represent is attention. 
So all of the, all of the companies, the big, big companies, big corporations who take on written words, spoken word, whatever, they would go to these to advertise it. So just beat them to it. It costs nothing. Just time, effort, and knowledge. I did the same thing. I was suddenly from January to, to June. I just all I did was study these platforms and how they work. That's my honest advice. Do, but, but, uh, straight from that, LinkedIn, right, for written word, right. Uh, Facebook for written words is pretty decent. Facebook's absolutely amazing. Uh, YouTube and Instagram for video, but try TikTok. See if you can do spoken word on TikTok, okay? Because I know there's an app that you probably never thought of, but there's so much free real estate for attention on there right now. It's really good. Okay, no worries. Just tell them. Did you know that we're going to change the office round before? No. No, they, uh, the company vastly expanded. Um, I, when I first started working with this company, it was only like five years in the office. It was amazing. It was really good, actually. It was only five years. It was small, it was tiny. And it was like tacky, kind of super, um, you know, I don't know, it was really good. But then they really grew rapidly. And then they opened up a, an office, like they opened up the door next to the office we were in. And then expanded the office to a bigger space and kind of started to go downhill from there, really. But when they, they, they kept having, like, the, the, the kind of directors kept having meetings without any of like, the actual staff. Because I was an assistant manager, but I didn't. You know, they didn't qualify for their director board meetings. Cost and they're like, oh, yeah, we'll just do this, this, and this. They come and just implement it. And everyone's just supposed to get on with it, you know? And then they didn't. It was just horrible. <laughs> so, yeah, I didn't know what I was going to do that now. So, so there's a question here, then. Um, you mentioned uh, having nurses or mental health team. How did you access that support? Are you Wales based? Or? Yeah, so I, I live on Anglesey. Um, so. Oh God, how did I So my doctor gave me a referral initially for my diagnosis of uh, ASD. And with the diagnosis came uh, two people. One of them was a guy called uh, David Oliver, who was an ASD development worker. And another one was a guy called Simon Mosley, who's a, uh, yeah, a, a therapist working for, and now works for ASD and for Wales, I think. Um, and so I didn't get a chance to meet Simon that time, but I didn't really refer to him. Uh, but then David Oliver helped me up with the mental health team, my like community mental health team, and they were the people who started me up with like the psychiatrists and the nurses and the CPMs and stuff like that. So uh, um, the, the, the mental health team, you should, there should be like a board, like a government health board that your mental health team are attached to for whichever county you're in, and that is the mental health team that also should take care of you if you're a constituent in that county. No, I didn't actually. So after I finished my degree, um, I was just floating around in the dark actually. Um, I didn't really do it. There was no support uh, available. That's why I was actually just focusing on YouTube at the time. Um, and then I was on some benefits because obviously, otherwise, what am I supposed to do, you know? And then, uh, and then YouTube kind of picked up. So it was kind of, I didn't, there was no, I didn't know of any help available. I'm not saying there isn't any, I'm just saying I didn't know of any, and there was nothing that brought to my attention. So I didn't know at the time. The best help and support I had was, was an ASD development worker that jumped when I was talking about David Oliver. And his post was in, was, was fine until we had an austerity government cut everything and then he lost his job. And it just cut straight away, he pulled from under me, and it was crazy. So I, had, I went to see this guy once a week, definitely, or two times a week, help with everything, everything. It help with any issues I had to access in any support community, and then just instantly back gone. That was quite a devastating time. So, in terms of Having a, a key worker or, or an ASD development worker, somebody who works with you or you know, a support worker is great if the funding is there and if the government can pay for it. But that would be the, yeah, that is the, that's the best way forward. Yeah. Anyway, right. Any questions before we wrap it up? Do you think that YouTube did not do a good job highlighting their autistic talent? on their platform in situations like with Copper and Article 17. Yeah, they, they did a terrible job of trying to highlight autism. Um, it's one of the things that I kind of bat with them a lot. So I, I work quite closely with YouTube, um, specifically quite high up in YouTube actually, some of the, the CEOs there, uh, sorry, the CEOs 
work into that. I haven't spoken to Susan, who's the CEO of YouTube directly yet, but I do know some people who do work with her, and we have spoken about mental health and autism quite extensively. And this is one of the issues that we had where in the biggest video conference in the world, there's no, you know, in America, one in 60 kids has a diagnosis, let alone people impacted by it there. There was no mention of any autism YouTube was on top. Even though, you know, 100,000 subscribers strong, never was I invited to talk on the panel. I had to actually go to Hank Green, who owns the panel, and say, hey, Hank, guess what? You know, you need autism on it. But yeah, I mean, we're working to change that, though, by the way. Yeah, I mean, the yeah, company are working to change it. Yeah. Hmm. Well, that answers the question. Yeah, yeah, hopefully you'll, you'll still have a platform in a couple of years' time. Well, hopefully, that's the thing. Don't put your eggs in one basket. I've seen a gentleman up there use every single one of these platforms because you never know which one's going to disappear. Okay. Oh, that's okay. Yeah, we're good. We're good. Thanks. Thanks.